Thank you so much for joining us for our Sunday morning service. Uh, I pray that the Lord will bless you in a wonderful way. And so glad that you're with us this morning. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to be with us in our service. Dear Father, Lord, I'm so thankful for your goodness, oh God. Lord, I praise you. I love you. Lord, I pray that you would be with us and that you would go with us, Lord, as we minister your word. Lord, touch each one, Lord. Let your presence speak. Lord, we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Bob Boyd is going to come and lead us in some songs. Would you join along and sing with us? Let God touch your heart. Okay, let's turn to page 144. Living by Faith. Today, what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain, the Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is made. Living by faith in Jesus above.
the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful for the presence of God. Thankful that God can come and reach down and touch our hearts. My text this morning is Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Lord, I praise you. I love you. I thank you. Lord, I pray that you would have your own way in the ministry of your word. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach this morning about the dimension of the eternal. The dimension of the eternal. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walking after the Spirit. That's my whole focus in my message this morning. Physics has taught us that there are three spatial dimensions height, width, depth, and a fourth dimension of time. So then, theoretically, we have a 4D world. Three spatial dimensions, height, width, depth, and one time dimension. Now, there are a lot of theories about dimensions in the world. And, I mean, a lot of them have a, a lot of uh, mathematics to go along with them. But I don't want to consider the things like the theories of a 5D world with three spatial dimensions and two time dimensions. Or string theories with ten or more dimensions. I want to propose, indeed, some extra dimensions in the world, but these are just things from my own thoughts. Now, classically, we have attributed emotion and intellect to be features of the personality of an individual. But what if, what if emotion and intellect were two very real dimensions. A dimension of emotion, a dimension of intellect. Dimensions of the world that can only be perceived by the human personality. And by personality, I'm speaking of that which is the sense of being and existence. It's what separates every person as an individual. So instead of spatial or dimensions of space or time, these would be phronesic dimensions, dimensions of the, the mind, dimensions that we perceive in our personality to coin. Now that's coining a uh, description, phonesic dimensions. So emotion would be a subjective dimension, whereas intellect would be an objective dimension. Emotion, a subjective dimension. Intellect, an objective dimension. And if these could indeed be valid perceptions of the fabric of the universe, it would explain the wildly divergent ways people seem to perceive reality. In the dimension of emotion, where everything is subjective, a person can believe that individually expressed love is the highest human expression. 
They can believe that hate and evil is the driving force behind conspiracies and disruptive influences. That artistic expression is the soothing oil that calms the world's troubled landscape. And that confrontations and resolution mapping is the answer to all of the world's problems. Emotion, subjective thoughts, and on the opposite extreme in the dimension of the intellect, where everything is objective, a person can believe that the solutions to all problems can be reduced to a mathematical equation. That science and empirical research will answer all the Earth's problems. That people with higher IQs and greater powers of reason should be the ones in charge of decisions and that the hope of the future lies with education and research. <sighs> Intellect, objectivity, dimensions. I, you know, what amazes me is that in talking with somebody in perhaps this little piece of the world, and I go many, many miles away to another little piece of the world, and I hear somebody give some of the very same things that I'd heard somebody talk about elsewhere and have some of the very same ideas. And it makes me wonder, is there a dimension of the emotional, a dimension of the intellect, simply because people have these same ideas all around the world without conversing with each other. Now, this would give, if these were dimensions, this would give an explanation as to why a person can be so completely convinced of being right. And many, many others agreeing with their point of view. But then having multitudes who disagree and everybody being convinced with documentation that they are the only right ones. I have heard people argue that there is no God, that everything has happened by natural processes. And then I have heard other people argue, me being one of them, that there is a God in heaven, a creator that created everything uh, by an act of his will and that everyone and everything is accountable and liable to his plan. And everybody has documentation. Every talking head on TV has documentation to prove that they are the ones who are right. If these two are actual dimensions in which we live rather than just states of mind, and that's what gets me, if it were just a state of mind, then there wouldn't be any coherence between people. But the coherence that people have in defending their point of view without consulting one another, it makes me think that there has to be something more than just a state of mind. And if these are actual dimensions in which we live rather than just states of mind, it would solve the mystery of why people are so solidly convinced they are right and equally convinced that everyone else is wrong. This would give us six dimensions. Three spatial dimensions, one time dimension, and two phronesic dimensions. The dimensions of emotion and intellect. But 
Now listen, this is just me speculating. I'm just, I'm, it's just mental exercises here. My mental meanderings. But there is a seventh dimension. Whether or not this, I mean the other two dimensions are real or not. I, I think that there's a, a very distinct possibility that they are. But this seventh dimension that I want to mention to you is one that I don't have any doubt about. I know that it's real. It's required. This seventh dimension is required for everything to work together as it should. And it is the dimension of the spiritual slash eternal. The spiritual dimension is not emotion or intellect. It transcends them both. It's above them. It's the dimension where knowledge resides that will never be comprehended by humanity. A knowledge so far above us that we will never know it or understand it. We might uh, grasp little bits of it, but it will always be above us. It's the dimension of the creator of the world, the dimension of the God of the universe, the deity who works all things together for good. Now, these phrone phronesic dimensions are mere speculations on my part. But this dimension of the spiritual, I'm sure about. I am absolutely convinced of its validity. And so this morning, I have some descriptions that I would like to share with you from the Bible concerning the dimension of the eternal and how it relates to us. So let's go back to Romans chapter 7. We started out in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Let's go back just a few verses to Romans chapter 7. And let's start with verse 14. Romans 7, 14 through 17. For we know that the law is spiritual... But I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Just for clarity, just for clarity, I want, that was from the King James Version, I want to read these same verses to you from the English Standard Version. Romans 7, 14 through 17 from the English Standard Version. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. These verses tell us that everything anyone does only brings guilt and condemnation. The dimensions of the emotional, of the subjective, uh, that, uh, things that we were just talking about. People want to do the right thing. A person wants to do the right thing, 
but is never able to with any degree of lasting success. Yes, at times a person can can get on the right track, but eventually somewhere, some way, somehow they end up doing all of those things they wish they hadn't have done. A person is always doing the things he or she doesn't want to do. A person in the dimension of emotion, trying to do the right thing but unable to do it, is weak, confused, and depressed. Now this isn't just for people that, that are weak-minded or that have a weak constitution or someone who is trying to get off of drugs or alcohol or some habit and it's just difficult. I'm telling you, this is all of humanity, no matter how strong of a constitution mentally someone may have. There is no real power to do the right thing. Verses 18, 19, and 20. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would... I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That was the conclusion we had in verse 17. No longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now verse 20, now, I, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So we have a culprit to blame besides ourselves. And it's sin that lives inside of us. You see, the will is not strong enough to override the desires of the body, the sinful desires. And there is no help in either the emotion or the intellect. The law of sin holds one in captivity. And here's the dimension of the intellect. Verses 21 to 25, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind or my intellect and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. That's, that's the dimension of the intellect. The intellect acknowledges the right thing to do. The intellect knows that there is an indeed an objective right and wrong. Everything's not all subjective. There is an objectivity to life that tells us that there are things that are right and things that are definitely wrong. But even though the mind serves God's law, the flesh serves the law of sin. Let's go there to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. 
the focus on the spiritual things beyond the physical world. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now, our text, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I really believe that the dimension of the spiritual is the answer to all the problems of life. All of them. And the Bible indicates that this dimension of the spiritual answers everything. In the spiritual dimension, the condemnation of sin has been removed. The way of living is completely different. The impulses that were once impossible to control are now under complete control, not because of emotion or intellect, but because of the power of the Spirit of God. The dimension of the Spirit changes everything. And Jesus gives freedom from the law of sin and death. Verses 2 and 3. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Regardless of how one feels their subjective about the law or how much one knows objectively about the law, the law will only bring condemnation to one's life. The flesh cannot keep God's law. Through the emotions or through the intellect, both of them fail in keeping the law of God. God the Father sent His only Son to die for the sins of humanity. God passed His judgment against sin in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. So living in the dimension of the spiritual is the only real solution to living the right way. Verses 4 and 5 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit." What spirit are we talking about? Oh, it's the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Ghost of God. The Spirit fulfills God's righteousness in those who live according to the Holy Spirit. Walking, walking after the Spirit. And when one lives in the dimension of the Spirit of God, it opens up a whole new world of understanding of life and living. And the things of the Spirit are the most important thing ever to anyone who follows the Spirit's leading. Praise the Lord. How does one enter the dimension of the Spirit? Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. How to, how to enter the dimension of the Spirit. I hope that there's a longing in every heart, in your heart, to follow after God, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how demanding it may seem to be at times, 
I hope you have that longing to pattern your life after the holiness of God, to walk after the Spirit of God. John 3 and 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Now this him that we're talking about is a man by the name of Nicodemus. He was one of the rulers of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night. So Jesus answered and said unto Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. It's one thing to describe the dimension of the Spirit, but how do you actually enter into that dimension? The answer is by being born again by the Spirit. There has to be a new birth. When it talked about being born of water, that's talking about a natural birth. Um, my pastor, Danny Taylor, uh, tells the story. I think it was his oldest child, uh, Danny Jr., uh, came running, running, running. He said, oh, Dad, Dad, we've got to do something. And uh, Mom's going to... Her, um, Sister Brenda was expecting, I think, their third child, maybe the fourth child. But anyhow, uh, uh, he said, Mama's fixing to have her baby. And Brother Pastor Taylor knew that this was not going to be for some time. And he said, oh, Danny, what's going on? Why, why, uh, why do you say that? He said, oh, Dad, I went to get me a drink of water and the waters broke. Well, a birth from water, the amniotic fluid that surrounds a baby, is this first birth that Jesus talked about, except a man be born again. How can he be born when he is old, except a man be born of water, a natural birth, and of the Spirit? Two separate, distinct births. So being born of water is a natural birth, making us a part of all of the natural dimensions. However many dimensions that your philosophy and science adheres to, that's, that's the natural birth. But being born of the Spirit, listen, I know this is true. I know it's true. Being born of the Spirit is an entry into an entirely different dimension than what is in the world anywhere. This is a dimension of the Spirit, the dimension of the Creator Himself. The dimension of the Holy Spirit is beyond Anything one can understand or comprehend. Uh, Jesus described it as being like the wind. There in verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, or it blows where it desires, where it wants to. You hear the sound, 
You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going. And this is the way it is with anyone born of the Spirit. The dimension of the Holy Spirit is beyond anything one can understand or comprehend. It's like the wind. One can hear it, feel it, and be moved by it. But no one knows from where it comes or where it goes. Whenever you are born again and you enter the dimension of the Spirit, oh, listen, the Spirit is heard. The Spirit is felt. And one is moved by the Spirit. But you're never, ever going to be able to figure it all out. Why would we need to figure it out when God has everything under control? Oh, my friend, my friend, God wants you to live in the dimension of His Spirit. Live there! I'm so thankful for God. You know, people have different views of who they think God is. But God does not sit around in a sulk. He's not just sitting there nursing His anger against people. In fact, God is a very patient and kind God. He is merciful gracious, and slow to get angry. Even the punishment of God's legal system. I mean, God has laws that He expects us to live by. But every punishment of God's legal system has been absorbed by His own Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah! Jesus took the consequence of our transgression in His own body when He died on the cross. And God wants to open your heart to the dimension of the Spirit, the place where He lives. God wants you to be born again. He wants you to live in the dimension of the Spirit. How do you do that? It's ABC. A. Admit that you are a sinner who needs a Savior. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one's accepted. Everybody is a sinner. I had to come to that realization for myself also that I am a sinner. It, the age doesn't make any difference. I was six years old whenever the Spirit of God revealed my sin to me. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I remember it in Fort Towson, Oklahoma. I have prayed with people. I prayed with an 84-year-old man who realized his need of a Savior. And when he finally came to the place to where he was willing to admit it, he asked Jesus to come into his heart. All have sinned, you may as well admit it, and come short of the glory of God. A. Admit. B. Believe that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to save you from your sins. It's an old verse that was, has been memorized over and over again. If you know it, would you say it with me? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Believe that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to save you from your sins. And number three, C, confess your sins to God and ask for His forgiveness. Do you think He would forgive you if you ask Him? He says He will. 1 John 1 and 9, 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Lord, I pray for that one watching this video, Lord, that doesn't know you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to their heart. Lord, I pray that you would show them that your free gift is available to anyone. Lord, let them know, Lord, that all they have to do is ask you. Tell you, Lord, I'm a sinner. I wish, I pray that you would be my Savior. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, now I'm confessing that I am a sinner. I have committed those sins and I pray that you would forgive me. Lord, I know that if anyone will come to you and just ask, you will in no wise Throw anyone out. Everyone is accepted by you. Lord, go with each one. Be with us. Give us your touch and your help. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of our Sunday morning service. And God bless you.